I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much, Joanne, for inviting me and uh, for IDA for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I actually didn't even find out about speech language pathology until I started volunteering at a literacy organization in North York in my mid twenties. Um, I didn't know that such a thing as a speech and language pathologist existed. Uh, and when I saw the description of what a speech and language pathologist does, I was immediately intrigued and um, started the process of applying and getting into speech and language pathology. And it has been an absolutely wonderful career Career. Um, I've had many opportunities and uh, uh, literacy is one of my main passions. So I'd like to start off and I know I'm wel welcoming parents, teachers, um, administrators, and uh, I know that there are some SLPs out there as well. So I'm going to start with uh, what is a speech and language pathologist? And uh, please SLPs just bear with me here. So a speech and language pathologist is a regulated health professional who provides intervention. And for me, that's assessment, treatment and consultation, any kind of intervention to individuals with communication disorders. And this is really important to their communication partners, to their families, colleagues, and friends. And we're often on an interdisciplinary team. Um, at the Peel Board, for instance, I worked with psychologists and social workers, and of course, teachers and principals. Um, but in other settings, we may work with occupational therapists or doctors. We service any age group, cradle to grade. And so in the cradle category, we have SLPs who actually work at neonatal intensive care units, helping families to learn how to communicate best with their really little one, um, and how to encourage that communication. We all know that babies start communication by crying. They, their cries are their first attempts at communication. And there's an absolute wealth of research on the cries of babies and how um, they can be distinguished within a fairly short period of time between hunger, uh, discomfort, um, or just attention and wanting some hugs. Um, as far as the grave part of, of things go, the, the more, um, you know, the, 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 less, uh, the less pleasant part, uh, we have been known as SLPs to be involved with uh, people who are seeking medical assistance in dying, especially those people who cannot communicate in traditional, traditionally with spoken words or are having issues with communication. And we are often uh, or can be involved in that communication to ensure that it's, uh, that it's clear and uh, that that person can then um, make that request um, in a very clear way to their medical professionals and their families and so on. So we really span the lifetime. Um, and of course, uh, I'm gonna be talking mainly about children this evening and children who are at school and struggling with reading and writing. And I've just spilled my water all over my desk. So <laughs> I thought I was being smart by leaving the lid off. Not so smart. Um, we work in many different settings. We work in hospitals, children's treatment centers, long-term care facilities, private practices, and of course, school boards. And I've highlighted school boards here because we're talking about students who are struggling with reading. The qualifications that uh, we need in order, to, um, in order to practice are a master's degree in speech language pathology. It could be a, a master's of health science, a master of science, a master of arts. It just depends on which university um, you attended. And we must in Ontario be registered with the College of Audiologists and Speech Language Pathologists of Ontario, or as we so affectionately call it, Castle Poe. And you'll find in our line of work, we have a ton of acronyms. So Castle Poe is one of the ones we use all the time. Um, a registered SLP will have a Castle Poe registration number. Mine, for instance, is number 1982. And uh, so if, if there are parents out there who are seeking private 
SLP services, you can actually go on the CASLPO website to ensure that that person is a registered speech language pathologist with CASLPO and you can get their registration number and you can also find uh, SLPs in your specific area. Um, even though I know that that's not really uh, relevant nowadays. Um, nowadays, we're doing a lot of things online. It doesn't really matter where we're doing them from. Um, CASAPO is, has a very important role in that they protect the public by setting the education and qualifications necessary by administering quality assurance programs um, and developing professional and ethical standards and guidelines. And these are, are documents that um, we constantly look at as SLPs to ensure that we're working at the standards we should be, and then also providing a complaint and discipline process if there is a member of the public who is not uh, satisfied with the services from their speech language pathologist. So that is a speech and language pathologist uh, in uh, just in a nutshell. And now I just want to talk a bit about these three terms, speech, language, and communication. And uh, for most people, we use these words interchangeably. But as speech language pathologists, we have very specific definitions of each one. And they're relevant because they make a difference in how we, uh, how we treat um, and how we treat disorders. And specifically for um, children struggling with reading or who are, have dyslexia, uh, we are really focusing on the language portion of uh, these, uh, the language terminology. So I'm just gonna start by um, giving you a visual. This is a visual I've worked with for a long time. Again, I apologize if people have seen this before, um, but the first, circle I see is speech. And usually at this time, I invite people to sort of comment and, and let me know what they, uh, what they perceive as what speech is. But because we have a very limited amount of time, and because of this platform, I'm just going to do it lecture style. Um, so speech to a speech and language pathologist is really about the physical act of speaking. It's how you use your respiration, your phonation or your voicing and your muscle movements um, or articulation in your, um, you know, lips, tongue, jaw, how you use those to actually produce spoken language. And so with speech, we have some subcategories. We look at articulation or pronunciation. And I'm sure we've all had experiences of children who um, are not able to be understood because they have uh, some, a lot of articulation issues. There is a certain amount of normalcy around articulation in that Many children uh, start off not being able to pronounce things completely perfectly, and they then are able to eventually uh, be able to pronounce uh, all of the sounds uh, in English. Um, the other area that we look at under speech is fluency. And fluency has to do with the rate of your speech and with uh, how, how smooth you can speak. So, People who have issues with stuttering would be, again, someone that a speech and language pathologist would see. And that would, in our, in our terminology, come under the speech umbrella. Uh, the final one, or sorry, uh, there's two more. One is voice. And so if there are a lot of teachers out there, I'm sure you've had experiences where after a long day of teaching, having to actually project your voice quite a bit, you might have a sore throat or you might have a bit of a harsh voice. Uh, some teachers may even experience laryngitis on a regular basis. Those kinds of voice issues are also things that fall under the speech umbrella and also things that a speech and language pathologist would, uh, would be able to help you with. Um, and finally, there's a, a little bit of a lesser known area, which is resonance. And that is the, the amount of air that's coming out of our mouth when we speak or coming out of our nose when we speak. And we need both types of airflow. Um, and, but typically, the children who have resonance issues have some, um, some kind of medical diagnosis, such as cleft palate. So those are all the areas that we as speech language pathologists would consider under the speech umbrella. 
Now, uh, when we look at the next circle, which encompasses speech, but has its own circle as well, that is language. And language, um, I'm going to very simplistically put into three dyads. Uh, I'm saying simplistically because there's a lot more um, there's a lot more interaction between all of these areas, but I have used this just to uh, let everybody know how we might want to parse those out a little bit and how we would look at each individual area in order to assess and then treat a, a language issue. So the three dyads are uh, firstly receptive and expressive. Receptive language is basically what it sounds like. It's receiving and processing and understanding language uh, that is coming at you uh, from your environment. Um, so it's really about the understanding. It does not, testing for this is best if you do not um, require a child to actually say anything because we really wanna get that idea of what are they understanding without having to speak. Um, so often uh, a lot of our tests in this area are pictures, um, you know, a, a choice of pictures. We say a word or a phrase or a sentence and the child has to choose the correct picture so we can get some idea of whether they're understanding. The other part to that diet, so we've got receptive or understanding. The other part to that diet is expressive language. And that's the actual ability to use the language. Um, usually receptive language is much higher than expressive language. And so um, usually a child knows a lot more than they're actually saying, but eventually they start to use words, phrases, and sentences. And so receptive and expressive are two areas that we want to look at as speech language pathologists and try to parse out. Is the problem more understanding? Is it more expression? Is it a combination of the two? How, what's going on with that? The other diet that we look at is oral language versus written language. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So oral language is, is uh, spoken language. Um, and uh, we're looking at how well the child can understand spoken language and use spoken language, both of those receptive and expressive. Written language is actually uh, uh, the mode of communication. So we can have a mode of communication orally, or we can have a mode of communication in written form. So in speech language pathology ease, that means it could refer to reading or to writing. It's about the mode of the communication. Is it oral or is it in a written form? So the, that's the, the, um, the second dyad that we look at. And um, the, the third dyad, if we've done the research, oh, is vocabulary and grammar. So children typically start by using words. Um, and those words are usually nouns, verbs, and eventually adjectives and adverbs. Um, but those single words can often say a lot uh, for, for a young child. However, uh, eventually a child has to put those words into sentences. And so we have all those rules about grammar, like putting a s at the end of a word means that there's more than one. And those are the kinds of rules that children need to learn. Now, again, we're looking at vocabulary and grammar, both receptively and expressively in oral form and in written form. So you can see how all of these things, we're looking at each one and they all connect. So we, we really want to get a sense of what's going on with that child's language in separate areas. But then we have to come up with a holistic a picture of what's going on with that child. And we'll be talking a lot more about this language area as we talk about the links between oral language and literacy. The final area is communication. And you can see communication encompasses language and speech. Really, why do we have language and speech? It's to communicate. Um, but this green circle in communication is really talking about the, a lot of the nonverbal or pre-linguistic um, communication attempts that children make or babies make. So we've already talked about crying. Um, other nonverbal forms of communication are facial expression, gesture, 
intonation. Intonation is a great way for a child to communicate. They can say the same word in different ways and mean different things. So for instance, a young child could say, Dada, and that means, oh, Dada, are you there? Or they could say, Dada, and that means, Dada, I'm not happy with you. I don't want you around. <laughs> so um, you can see how these nonverbal forms of communication are really um, enhancing and a part of the, uh, a, a, it, it's the big picture um, and it includes language and speech. Oh, I don't know what happened there. It disappeared on me. Okay, so I hope that gives um, uh, some kind of um, background as far as what we think of as speech, language and communication. I just wanna pause here for a second and give you a more specific example because it's really relevant to our next few slides of the difference between a, an articulation or speech difficulty uh, versus an oral expressive language difficulty. And these two often, you know, we, um, we might hear about a child who's not speaking well, but as speech language pathologists, we really wanna know, is that because they can't pronounce the sounds well, they can't articulate well, or is it because they, they, in their brain, they just don't have that vocabulary or that grammar structure and they're not able to express themselves well uh, with language. So just the, uh, an example of the difference between an articulation or a speech difficulty and a language difficulty would be um, a child who's maybe trying to say, I'm going to the store. And a child with a speech difficulty might say, I'm going to the tour. Okay, so they're not pronouncing their sounds well, um, they're having issues and they may be difficult to understand. A child with a language, an oral expressive language issue who um, uh, would be saying the same sentence in this way, me go there. So they might be able to pronounce their sounds perfectly and everybody can understand what they're saying but they're not using specific vocabulary like store. They're not using grammatical structures like pronouns I and am going. Um, so they're having difficulties with that language portion rather than the speech portion. So children can um, have difficulty speaking in those uh, two different ways. And often, of course, we see children who have both issues. And so we as speech language pathologists want to know, well, we want to tease that out a bit and know exactly what is, uh, what is the difficulty. The children that we are um, most concerned about in school and for the difficulties with reading are children with language issues. Those are the children that we see um, usually as having a difficulties later on with written language because oral language is really the foundation of written language. So if we go to the next slide now I'm going to um, oh sorry uh, we're just gonna I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of the disorders that we do um, intervene with uh, as speech and language pathologists. And um, the terminology has been problematic in the past, uh, but it's getting better. And we are now, we now have these two terms that we're trying to make consistent um, for speech and language pathologists really across the world. So um, I, I'm not sure how long ago, maybe five years ago, these uh, two terms came into, uh, into our literature and into our vernacular. And so we, we look at children who have language disorders associated with biomedical conditions or LD with ABC, there's those acronyms again. Uh, so those would be children who uh, perhaps um, have Down syndrome or autism spectrum disorder or any other syndromes or disabilities. And we kind of expect, I think, uh, most, most people expect a child with those biomedical conditions to have some issues with communication, with language and or with speech. However, there is a very, there is a group of children who do not have biomedical conditions but they're still having difficulties 
acquiring language. And we can see this as early as 30 months, um, to two and a half years old. And those children, once we look at them and assess them and uh, you know, try some things with them, those children uh, would receive a label. Uh, it's not a diagnosis, it's a label of developmental language disorder. Actually, SLPs cannot diagnose anything. So this is a label that we're now trying to use consistently um, in our reports and so on. And this is a language disorder with no known biomedical etiology and it can coexist with literacy disorders such as dyslexia, poor reading comprehension, and we'll go over those uh, terms a little bit later, and language learning disorders. In fact, uh, some um, authors have posited that these latter disorders like language learning issues, dyslexia, uh, and reading comprehension are often the consequence of a developmental language disorder that perhaps started way before school did, and it can have impacts on academic achievement. There's the, uh, the reference for that there. And I also included the link to DLD and me, which uh, describes a little bit more about developmental language disorder and actually has videos of, um, of children and parents uh, describing um, how DLD has impacted them. Okay, so here's my house visual. This is something I developed, uh, oh, um, I don't know, maybe about 10 or 15 years ago. You can see I am no artist and certainly not with uh, technology. You can see the lines aren't quite, quite even. <laughs> I probably need to get one of the young SLPs in our department to really work on this and make it look a little bit better. So uh, barring that, let's just look at the content. <laughs> so. The foundation of the house, as you can see at the bottom, really has to do with that oral language uh, dyad that we talked about, receptive and expressive. And as, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to know how the child can understand or how much the child can understand uh, as far as vocabulary and what they can do to express vocabulary. Can they use vocabulary easily? The other thing we have to look at in this foundational area is how well the child can understand grammatical components like that at the end of words to denote plural and how well they are using those grammatical components in their own language. And finally, uh, this, uh, these are, this is the diet I talked about, but there is another layer to this and that is narrative skills. And these are more about understanding and being able to tell stories, to retell stories, or to even retell events that have happened to them during the day. And are they able to do that? Are they able to understand those? And are they able to, to use language in order to tell you a story as well? So these are all the foundational skills that we need in order to do higher level language skills. And these, we often see children, as I said, as young as 30 months to be able to see how they're doing with all of these uh, skills. And are they acquiring language in a developmentally appropriate way or are they struggling with developing language? So um, that's sort of the foundation. And now we're gonna look actually, we're gonna go right up to the roof and uh, look under the roof. And these are, um, I guess I put them under the roof because more top down skills, they really require a lot more awareness. And these three skills are phonological awareness, phonics and orthographic rule knowledge and application. I'll go over those uh, in a bit more detail. Phonological awareness is the ability to hear a word and um, understand it. So a word like cat, and then figure out that it's actually made up of three sounds. It is not actually re really made up of three sounds. When we see cat on a spectrogram, for instance, it comes out as one big blob. There's not a k or an a or a t. But in order to read, we have to impose that structure on spoken language so that we can figure out that alphabetic principle that k, a, t together makes cat 
or that if you want to spell cat, you have to think about it and then segment, segment it into those three little sounds. So phonological awareness is, um, is, uh, is, is, first of all, it's one of the best predictors of good reading skills. We can test phonological awareness. In SK, I would say, even in JK, we can do some preliminary screening for phonological awareness, um, but we can absolutely in JK look at these foundational skills. Phonics, on the other hand, is uh, what we all know and love, which is, you know, A says ah, E says eh. So what are the letters and what are the sounds that go with them? Or what are the sounds and how do you spell those sounds with letters? Now, letters and sounds don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence. So for instance, sometimes there's two letters that go together to make one sound like SH for sh. Or sometimes there's one letter that can make more than one sound, for instance, C could say k or s, um, in, in, depending on the environment that it's in. So we have to teach those, um, those, those little, uh, those discrepancies. And we have to, to let kids know that, um, you know, when you say this sound, it may be more than one letter. And those are uh, digraphs or um, diphthongs for vowels. So that's, the basic difference between phonological awareness and phonics, I could spend probably two days just talking about phonological awareness um, and, and how it relates to phonics and how you can uh, utilize both of those and, and put them together eventually. But we do need both of these skills in order to um, decode and encode, which we'll be talking about shortly. Orthographic rule, knowledge, and application. I should really just call it spelling, rule, knowledge, and application. And a lot of people say there's no rules in English spelling. There are rules. There are six main syllable types. And those six main syllable types can account for about 80% of um, content words when you're looking at uh, reading and writing and spelling. And so uh, children don't typically know these like you wouldn't be able to to say them they may have learned something like you know um the magic e makes the vowel say its own name um when two vowels go walking the first one does the tongue that's not really true all the time uh, but they they may have learned some of those rules but for a lot of children who are having issues with this they may have need explicit teaching about these rules and i think um Joanne uh, uses a program in uh, when she's tutoring that really focuses a lot on these uh, spelling rules, as uh, does Orton, the Orton Gillingham method. Um, so these three under the roof skills, uh, I sort of think about it as if there was a leak in the roof, then these would kind of get watery and blurry, and it would not really help the child to do. Uh, the next part, which is decode and encode. So you can see that all over here on the left side of the graph, we're looking at comprehension. And so when we uh, look at the lines on a page, the little marks on a page, and we figure out what that word is, that is decoding. And you can see how we need all these three skills in order to be able to decode. Um, not only do we have to be able to decode, but we have to be able to do it fluently, which means accurately and speedily. So if you're decoding a sentence and you have to very laboriously sound out every single word and sound out each, each uh, sound of the word, then of course you're, you may be accurate, but you're not gonna be speedy. And by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you may not remember what you've read at the beginning of the sentence. So that fluency, that decoding fluency is very important. It doesn't, it, it can't just be accurate. It has to be speedy as well. Um, and for encoding, that's when we think about a word in our head, we're able to segment it into its, its parts um, that are not really there, but those little parts. And then we're able to um, associate or uh, correspond those sounds with the letter or what we call the grapheme, which could be one letter, it could be two letters, it could be a little, a bit of a rule like T-I-O-N. Um, so when we're able to do that, then we're able to encode. So 
these, uh, all of these skills, the foundational skills, these uh, under the roof skills, um, a result in decoding and encoding and eventually in reading comprehension and written expression. You can see how all of the skills are needed to get to this first floor of the house, which is where the, all the action takes place, right? Uh, usually the first floor has the kitchen, living room, the dining room. And so that's where the action is. And so that's what we're really trying to have uh, students do is to comprehend what they've read because eventually they're going to be reading things in order to learn. Um, in the in the early school years, hopefully they're learning to read, but eventually they're going to be reading to learn. So that is the house visual. And um, I hope that's given some kind of um, background or, or uh, basis for uh, when we talk about children who are struggling to read. I'm just going to compare this visual, the house visual with the reading rope, which some of you may be um, familiar with. Um, this reading rope, sorry, I'm just gonna take a sip. <laughs> this reading rope, um, I think, um, I I'm not sure, I, I know a lot of, uh, a lot of people who are um, uh, experts in reading, they use this to sort of describe uh, the very, the complex, uh, the complexity of reading. So you can see that the rope is made up of, um, you know, two smaller ropes, which are then made up of uh, individual strands. The language comprehension portion, which includes background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, and verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge. You can see their vocabulary we've talked about. We've talked about language structures, grammar. Um, that is actually the same thing as this foundation. And so, um, so you can see that the reading rope and, and the, the visual that I have here is, is very similar. The word recognition portion is uh, really the top part, the under the roof part of the house. So as you can see, the reading rope uh, talks about phonological awareness as well, decoding, which we talked about as well. And um, now the sight recognition is very interesting. Um, we do need to learn words, I'm sorry, um, just by, by visually memorizing them. Uh, but the words that we need to visually memorize are words that are frequently occurring in language. And they're generally a close set of words that really have more to do with those grammatical components and not as much to do with the content. So I'm just going to give you an example of that. I'm going to read this sentence at the bottom, um, figure 10.2, and um, I'm going to read only the sight words, the words that we need to learn by sight and just by, by memorizing them. And you'll see that uh, the words that are more regularly spelled, where we need our decoding uh, skills and our phonological awareness, phonics and orthographic rule skills, um, those are actually the ones that carry more of the meaning. So I'm going to read this sentence at the bottom with just reading the sight words. The, of, the, that, are, in, ing, and, to, and. So you can see that those words, yes, we need to know them. They're important. We need to connect uh, you know, connect vocabulary with those grammatical words. Otherwise, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't have those grammatical meanings, and we wouldn't be able to connect ideas together. However, the words that really we need to decode, where we need all those skills of phonological awareness, those are the ones that carry most of the content of what's going on. Um, and it's interesting when I uh, when I did this when I was practicing I was noticing that many of the words in this uh, sentence are actually regularly spelled words. <laughs> so uh, that's good to see. <laughs> um, and those are the ones that you know if if a child is is taught uh, these things explicitly they they should be able to decode those words. I'm also going to talk just a little bit about uh, how to categorize reading disorders 
So this is a chart. You'll see um, Norbury Goss, uh, Norbury and Goss a lot. Uh, and that's because, sorry, Paul Norbury and Goss, because uh, when I was teaching at McMaster uh, in the spring, this was the textbook they used. And so um, I have this textbook. So I, I have quite a few references from them. Um, so, sorry, let's go to that next one. Um, so you can see here that we have, we can have difficulties with word recognition or with language comprehension or a combination of the two. If we look back at, at the house, the word recognition part is this decoding and encoding, which is reliant on the under the roof skills. And the um, language comprehension portion is this portion down here, the, uh, the, the foundation of the house, all of the oral language skills. So if we go to this chart again, and we look at children who have good language comprehension, so they're you know, right from the start, they were understanding what was said to them, and they continued to learn. And you know, once they got to kindergarten, they were understanding what the teacher was saying, they were putting ideas together, all of that is really good. And then once they start, um, uh, start into learning how to read, they are also able to use their phonological awareness phonics and, and orthographic rule knowledge um, in order to decode, uh, in order to recognize those words, they're going to be right over here. The good, good is this blue area over here, typical reading skills. So, uh, you know, we're not so worried about those children and those children generally, the children who have both of, you know, all of these great skills, they are likely going to read no matter what kind of instruction you give them. They are going to somehow implicitly understand this is how this works. I look at this word and I figure out the sounds and then I put the sounds together and I can read the word. And they're not doing that consciously, but they have uh, somehow gleaned those rules and all of those things. However, there's, uh, there are our children who are not going to be able to do that and need very explicit and specific type of instruction in order to help them. So let's look at a child that has good word recognition skills, but poor language comprehension skills. So good word recognition and poor language comprehension is one of the green areas over here on the right hand side, which is called specific comprehension deficit. These are the kids. Um, who can decode almost anything. They can probably, uh, a lot of them can decode above their age level. So you put a, a grade two or a grade three text in front of them and they're in, in kindergarten and they're able to decode that text. They're able to say all the words. However, once they finished reading or decoding, they do not understand what they have read. Um, we often, uh, so we call these, uh, a lot of times these children are labeled as hyperlexic. And we see this sometimes with children who have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, who are able to uh, have somehow figured out all those rules and are able to do that, but they're not understanding what they've read. So they're having problems with that foundational part of the house. They may not be able to understand the vocabulary, grammar, or story stories um, that, uh, that they read. And when they're read to, they still don't understand. So they can read it, they can decode it, but they're not understanding. However, those children who have good language comprehension skills and poor word recognition skills, those are the ones that are typically labeled with the term dyslexia. And those are the kids that if we go back to our house drawing are actually doing okay with language. They're developing language well. Uh, and we, we don't see anything going on with them in preschool. However, once they get to school and they start to, uh, you know, they're starting to, all their peers are starting to read, they're really struggling with uh, decoding. And often we find that those children are having difficulties with these under the roof skills, phonological awareness, phonics, and orthographic rule knowledge. And those are the ones that are typically labeled um, with the term dyslexia. Now, what about the poor kids who have poor word recognition 
and also poor language comprehension. Well, uh, those are a lot of the children that we as speech language pathologists in the education system, we would see those children uh, because they, they are quite severe. Um, so again, if we go back to the visual of the house, they have problems both in the foundation skills and in the under the roof skills. And those kids really uh, do show up um, usually a little bit sooner, sometimes in grade one or two, those, those are the, the children that would come to us or even in kindergarten. Um, but the thing about that is uh, we could probably have noticed that as speech language pathologists before they even got to school. We would have noticed that there were uh, issues with that child acquiring language. And we could have maybe um, identified a group of children that were at risk uh, for, for uh, any one of these three areas. Um, so that's what we really wanna do. We wanna try and get these children at a very young age so we can do as much prevention as we can, or at least decrease the severity of the disorder, of the reading disorder. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about another article that, um, that, I, uh, that I looked at. And um, although I knew this information clinically, it's always good to have some references. Um, and this particular article talked about um, understanding dyslexia in the context of developmental language disorders and the correlation or co-occurrence of uh, children with dyslexia and DLD was quite high. So 55% of children with dyslexia could also be classified as having developmental language disorder. And alternatively, 51% of children with DLD could be classified as having dyslexia. And so again, um, I hearken back to an earlier part of the presentation where I said some uh, authors, some, some SLPs, some researchers believe that developmental language disorder is kind of a, the, the outcome of developmental language disorder that's perhaps not treated or perhaps uh, is quite severe in preschool will end up with a, some kind of a label like dyslexia, um, language learning disorder, and so on. Um, and it makes sense when we look back at the reading rope and that these two things have to come together in order to, uh, in order to have good reading comprehension. And when we, sorry, when we look back at the uh, house visual, we need all of these areas to be working in order to decode and encode well. Uh, so I'm just checking the time here. Uh, we're getting close to the end and um, thankfully I'm, I think I'm on my last few slides. So how can we as speech language pathologists help children who are struggling with reading? Well, um, I believe we can help them in, in all three tiers. So um, if, if uh, some of you aren't familiar with the tier system, it's basically like a pyramid with the bottom being sort of the largest part. And really that is um, describing intervention that's good for every child. The middle part is tier two, and that's a, a type of intervention that's good for some children. Um, and the top part, the very uh, top part of the pyramid is much smaller and it's really um, describing intervention that is good for a few children. So what can we as SLPs provide as far as those three tiers are concerned? So tier one, um, often referred to as a good for all, and um, it's often described in the universal design for learning. So we're looking at trying to improve the design for learning overall in order to benefit all children and all students. Well, the first thing I think that we could provide as speech language pathologists is screening. Screening for JK and SK kids. Uh, as I said before, we start seeing those children, we can start seeing those children much earlier, even uh, in, at preschool ages. Uh, and we can usually at 30 months sort of see if there's some difficulties there. Um, and in the Peel District School Board, we have a program called, or we used to have a program called Sound Skills. Um, and I just wanna say that I think 
every educational SLP I've ever spoken to has developed or their department has developed some kind of screening tool or intervention tool for these preschool and, and um, uh, sorry, for these JK and SK kids in order to improve their phonological awareness and hopefully prevent some later difficulties. So screening, I think, is one of the areas that we can really help with. Unfortunately, uh, we used to do screenings in JK and SK. Um, however, we just don't have the staff at this point and we um, are, are not able to do as much screening as we would like. So uh, it would be great if we could screen every child that enters uh, school. The other thing we can do in that tier one, the bottom of the pyramid, is to coach and team teach with the caregivers, early childhood education, educators, and of course, teachers. Um, and we actually do do this quite often um, at, at the Peel Board anyways. Uh, we can often go into a, a kindergarten classroom without necessarily having a specific referral for a specific child and talk to the teacher, observe the class, maybe, um, uh, you know, do an activity to, to model some of the ways that we can improve that oral language foundation and also teach some phonological awareness skills um, and, and phonics and eventually phonics and orthographic rules as well. And finally, uh, the way I think an SLP could uh, be helpful in that tier one is to consult to school boards and curriculum developers. Uh, I mean, why don't we have this as part of the curriculum so that every child benefits from these types of instructions? And um, I'm happy to say, I think my boss is here tonight. Hi, Dawn. Um, I'm happy to say that um, uh, I, I just started this job in September, but already I have been um, asked to join um, the curriculum sort of department of our board in order to talk about how uh, speech language pathology can help with, with curriculum. So I'm very happy to be able to do that. Um, and, and, you know, what we would focus on in terms of reading is oral language development and phonological awareness uh, development. If we focus on that prevention in preschool and kindergarten, perhaps we'll decrease the number of children that need help later on. Tier two, what I think SLPs can do in this area, this is the sort of the good for some area. So it's the second part, the, the second part of the pyramid is um, uh, maybe some more specific evaluations um, to, to really weed out those children who are having difficulties with oral language and pre-literacy skills, and then group those students together to maybe provide some group instruction. And um, what we have at the Peel Board, and again, I want to reiterate that I believe almost every board in Ontario, the speech language pathologists in that board have, have come together to develop some kind of intervention for children who are having uh, difficulties with oral language and phonological awareness. But in the Peel Board, we have what's called links to literacy. And uh, we've just, uh, I think in the past year or two, developed another one called Foundations to Links. Um, so links to literacy is a program for grade one students who are struggling. And they're often identified by their teachers as not picking up on uh, reading as quickly as other uh, children in their class. And so the teachers will group those students and the speech and language pathologist comes in and does a lesson. And lessons in our case are games. They're fun activities and games and the kids love them. So the SLP would come in and do and team teach with the teacher that particular lesson and then have the teacher uh, go ahead and do some more of that teaching throughout the week. And then the next week, the SLP would then again team teach with the teacher. And then again, that teacher would do the same, uh, the same types of activities for the next week. And I believe um, in our links to literacy, there are 22 uh, lessons. And so, um, you know, you can easily get through 
the whole thing in a school or academic year. Um, so, so a few SLPs who were uh, very, very um, instrumental in developing that program. And uh, now, of course, uh, all of the SLPs in the department have access to that and can provide it uh, to their grade one teachers. The foundations to links, it's funny, um, the links to literacy was, was developed and then it was realized, oh, well, some of these kids need something even a little bit um, more basic than the links to literacy. So why don't we develop a program for them as well? And despite the fact that these uh, two programs uh, are made for grade one students, they can be used uh, you know, all the way up to grade three uh, because they really teach those foundational skills and those under the roof skills. Finally, tier three, this is, the, this is the area that SLPs generally work. Uh, these are the students that um, SLPs generally work with at the schools. Um, and these are the students who are really struggling. They're struggling with oral language. They're struggling with the uh, phonological awareness. They're struggling with decoding. And those are usually, it's pretty obvious that they're having um, issues. And so they usually get referred to us as an individual um, student. And we generally then would do an assessment and then provide some suggestions and resources in order uh, for them to benefit. Um, and so these, we really, with these children would have to look at very specific areas of difficulty and then come up with a holistic plan for them. Um, we might use a more individualized program for reading remediation with these children, like direct instruction. Uh, Language Live is a, a web-based program for older children, grades six to 12. And um, I have, um, I've had students use that uh, in actually, interestingly enough, in classes um, where the students, uh, it's a contained class where students all have uh, concomitant mental health disorders. And so uh, it's very interesting to see that connection as well between mental health, social emotional learning and well-being and difficulties with language, including reading. Um, and of course, in this tier three area, we would also provide education, education, coaching and training for the school and the home teams. So I think that is it. Oh, I just have a slide here on how to access an SLP. And I think um, if some of you are reading the earlier version of the um, handouts, this first point is not on there. So sorry, I added this when I realized I, I didn't put anything in about preschool services. Um, if your child is preschool age, you can refer to your local preschool speech and language service. And those PSL services are usually a part of your uh, children's treatment center, like Aeronaut Kids, uh, Kids Ability, uh, I know out in the Guelph area, or sometimes they're operating more independently like Early Words um, in Hamilton. Um, I've just provided there the link to um, the specific where you can find specific uh, PSL services in your community. So that's a ministry, um, a ministry website. Um, if your child is in school, you would first of all talk to your child's teacher um, or ECE, early childhood education or principal. Um, I, I, I recommend starting with a teacher and asking if the child can be referred to an SLP in the school. Um, we, most schools in Ontario have access to a speech and language pathologist. Um, it depends on which, air, which region you're in, how, how, much, um, how much of a caseload that SLP has. So for instance, at the Peel Board, when I first started in 2004, I had seven schools to serve. So that meant that uh, I wasn't able to do direct therapy on a regular basis with all the students who required the services, um, but I was able to provide assessment and consultation and some of the um, some of the tier one services that I talked about before. Um, you can also uh, look for a private speech and language pathologist. And as I mentioned before, you can get a list of those through Castlepo. 
And if you are uh, wanting to advocate for more SLP services, there is an association called the Ontario Association of Families of Children with Communication Disorders. It's quite, quite the long acronym, OAFCCD. Um, and they, uh, that is their that is their main focus and their main function. And of course you can talk to your trustee or your MPP um, if you so desire. Um, and I think that is it. I am ready for any questions. And oh, we only have one minute. Ah, I just saw it turned 8.30, but I'm here. I'd be happy to answer any questions and I'll stay as long as there are questions. Thank right. you. Thank you so much, Karina. We have had so many questions and many, many chat entries. We really appreciate everyone's participation. There was a lot of interest. You have shared really important information and I think you've inspired a lot of people. Thank you so very much. So- Very welcome. We're going to have a period of 10 minutes of questions and then I'll wrap up with some information about other upcoming webinars. All right? Right. So as right. a Veronica, uh, if you'd like to chime in, we'll begin with questions. Uh, perfect. Um, Karina, there yes. were a number of questions in regards to the Lynx program. Yes. Uh, one specifically, can SLPs purchase the Lynx program mm -hmm. from the PDSB? Um, are these lessons available to share with other educators or boards? And are they available wild widely? So not yet. Not yet. But we're looking into that. Um, we did actually, uh, at one point, uh, this sound skills, the other program I was talking about, we did actually set, uh, sell that to other school boards and we have had, um, we have had interest in the links to literacy program. And so, uh, right now we kind of have, um, uh, one SLP in particular, Sylvia Cutmore, she's just amazing, um, who sort of makes sure that everybody has the Lynx kits and she is actually creating those Lynx kits or having volunteers come in and help her create them. Um, but we would love to have them more readily available, but we have to look into how to develop those kits um, more easily, um, more effectively, and... Um, and then how to actually uh, sell them. <laughs> so not yet, but uh, hopefully that's something that we're looking into right now. Great. Next question. Okay, Karina. Yes. Um, we got a lot of questions out, so we might not be able to go through all of them, but we'll mm -hmm. try to uh, do the ones that are uh, most common. Sure. Uh, so we did have a, a question that was very specific to SLP certification yes. and uh, the question said, is it possible that an SLP might not be registered with um, CASLPO yes. or don't have a CASLPO number, does that mean that they aren't an actual mm -hmm. SLP? Yes, yes, possibly to both. So it could be that uh, someone without a, a CASLPO number maybe did, did have a CASLPO number and lost their license. That's, that's one possibility, lost their uh, ability to be um, a, a part of CASLPO. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that perhaps um, someone's calling them a, calling themselves a speech therapist, a language therapist, which is an unprotected title. Speech language pathologist is the protected title. And anyone who calls themselves a speech language pathologist must be in Ontario registered with CASLPO. So I would, um, I would definitely um, look at the CASLPO website and um, ensure that the speech and language pathologist that you are thinking of, of going to privately is registered. Otherwise they will not um, be bound by the same regulations or credentials. Okay. Uh, thank you. So um, there are some questions um, about DLD and so yes, so mm -hmm. terminology to clarify terminology. So one of these questions is: uh, if a child had ADHD and mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, as a, you were cutting out there a bit, I just didn't hear the rest of that. 
as I can read it. If it, yeah, maybe as I'll as go I ahead and read it. Veronica, it's, yeah, yeah. If, LD, if a child LD, had um, had ADHD and a language it. disorder, mm -hmm. would it be considered LD with ABC or DLD? Um, I don't think, uh, no, AD, uh, ADHD, I don't think is a biomedical diagnosis as far as I know. It would, um, you can have a, um, a correlation of ADHD and DLD. And we absolutely, um, you know, in the school boards, we see a lot of that. Um, and sometimes I wonder if the ADHD um, is because of the, um, uh, de uh, the developmental language disorder, because if you can imagine being in, uh, in school, um, you know, when we were all in the building, in the school building, but if you can imagine that, and now it's even, even worse for some of these children um, trying to be on a computer uh, for, for and being online. Um, but if you can imagine being in that environment and trying to learn and not being able to understand what the teacher is saying. I mean, what do we do? If we were at a lecture uh, being given by a rocket scientist and we didn't understand the first sentence that came out of that uh, professor's mouth, we would probably look very ADHD. We'd probably be moving on our chairs. You know, I'd be doodling, I'd be texting. I'd be doing all sorts of things that I wasn't necessarily supposed to be doing and I was supposed to be paying attention. But if, if I'm not understanding, why should I be paying attention? So um, not that we would ever say a speech language pathologist, no, this child doesn't have ADHD. Of course, we can't do that. We can't diagnose. However, we do see that correlation quite a bit. And uh, sometimes I think it, um, part of that at least is due to the fact that the child has a developmental language disorder. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Lisa Archibald is on at this point, but she would know whether ADHD is considered a biomedical condition, or I, I don't think it is. I think uh, we're really talking more about things like autism and Down syndrome, um, but she might be able to chat and chime in on that. Great, um, I'll keep an eye out and see if there's any comments about that. Great. Uh, another question um, that we have are, um, what are some classroom-based supports for kids who struggle uh, with comprehension? Yeah, so uh, I mean, some very, very basic sort of broad uh, suggestions might be to um, ensure that you are, when you're teaching, you're using lots of modes like visuals and uh, auditory, you know, auditory signal, but they're also getting some visuals at the same time, that you chunk the information, that you speak slowly, that you ensure that uh, that the especially the child of concern um, has understood by perhaps spending some time with them afterwards and and seeing if they have you know asking some questions to see if they have understood uh, what you've said. So those are some very broad general um, suggestions that we might make, um, and then we would look at the specific areas that that child is struggling with and give more specific. Um, ideas and suggestions. Great. Just going back to your last uh, answer, Lisa did respond and said your response was accurate. So. Oh, yay. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, another question we have. Um, uh, sorry, I'm just going through them. There no, are so many fine. great questions. Um, oh, can you recommend any screening tools that are commercially available? Um, uh, screening tools as far as um, uh, phonological awareness. Um, so I'm really more familiar with the with the screening tools that we used at the Peel Board. Um, I don't. I think Joanne, you probably know some of these, um, and probably if you start saying them, I'll be like, oh yeah, I, I know that one, <laughs> but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. One that's popular lately is Dr. Kilpatrick's past. Oh, yes. It's free. He has it on his website, Phonological Awareness Screening Tool. Yeah. It's not the be all and end all. Uh, he, he, locked, he likes the CTOP as well. 
The C top is uh, is it's it's really a longer test. It's not really a screener, but the other the one that I use all the time and it's very quick. Um, it's called the test of auditory analysis skills by Rosner. It's very old, but it works. Um, it wouldn't be something that I would necessarily think that a kindergarten child uh, would be, uh, it wouldn't be appropriate necessarily for a kindergarten child, but for a grade one child, I, I would feel comfortable giving it to a grade one child. For a kindergarten child, um, you really need to see, can they, you know, um, segment words into syllables? Can they clap out the syllables of words? Can they um, make, can they produce rhyming words? Can they recognize rhyming words? Those would be some of the things you would want to do. There is a, a kit or a, a book that I use a lot. It's basically just drills and it's called Phonological Awareness Chipper Chat. It has in the back of it, it has screening tools for each very minute part of phonological awareness. Um, and so you can go through that screening tool and just say, oh, okay, uh, you know, my child can do the syllable clapping, can, can segment syllables, can blend syllables. But once we get to phonemes or sounds, they are not able to segment a sound, segment the sounds like in k at, for instance. Um, and they're having problems with the beginning sounds or the end sounds or the middle sounds. So uh, that's another one that I have used in the past. Um, but I tend to do the, the Rosner screener. It has 13 items. So it's quick and, and fairly easy. And um, I think um, uh, 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 Mr. Kilpatrick, Dr. Kilpatrick also uses similar types of, um, yeah, his, similar types of activities, right? He based his on the Rosner and another one. Yeah. But um, Azza and Veronica, help me out. Don't we have some cleaning tools on, a, on the IDA Ontario website? Many, don't we? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and Nadine Gab's uh, screening tool is highly regarded as well as the Dibbles. Dibbles, mm -hmm. are, right? Okay, so uh, we have some sharing from uh, Artie Shaw. Um, I will, uh, I will try to share it in the chat. Okay, she has a screening tool as well. Okay, Wonderful. do we have more questions, ladies? Uh, there's another one here about if you could speak to the difference between orthographic rules and orthographic mapping. Oh, um, I don't know what that difference is. Um, so orthographic rules are, um, as I said, those six basic syllable types. Um, and I mean, orthographic mapping, it sounds like maybe that is being able to understand what those rules are and map them onto, um, uh, onto, onto written language. So either by, um, knowing that, um, you know, when you put an E at the end of a, a consonant vowel consonant, that that will make the uh, vowel say its own name. Um, so you're understanding that rule, but you're able to actually implement it. I'm not sure if I, I haven't heard the term orthographic mapping. So I'm not sure if that's it, but that would be my, my best guess. Okay. Uh, I can help out. Uh, Dr. Kilpatrick talks a lot about orthographic mapping. And you begin by learning to decode the word. You begin by reading it and saying it very, very frequently, a repeated exposure. And with, within a short period of time, if you're not a child with difficulties, that word becomes easily re recognized and it becomes a sight word, right? Mm. So his def well, the definition of sight word lately has been any word that you can quickly recognize, be it a high frequency irregular word or be it a word that follows the rules. Okay. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, you can look up orthographic mapping with Kilpatrick and some other researchers. All right, thanks. Great. Thanks, thanks, Joanne. Um, Karina, this one's a little bit, uh, it must come from a parent. So if we suspect dyslexia with our child based on the Paul Norbury and Ghost uh, figure, what, mm -hmm. should, what should our next steps be? Our child is, uh, was born in 2014. Uh, so grade one then oh. or grade two? Okay. Uh, so the first step would be to talk to the teacher and say, are you seeing the same struggles that we are at home, the struggle to read? Um, my biggest recommendation in the meantime, 
while you're looking, investigating other things is to read to your child. So continue reading to your child um, because we want them to continue to um, develop that founda those foundational skills that we talked about, these foundational skills and the way that they're going to continue to develop those skills is by hearing uh, things being read to them, stories being read to them, because that's where the rich vocabulary and, and grammatical structures are. So uh, in the immediate, continue reading to your child and don't expect them to decode yet because if they're having problems with this, reading is going to become a chore and they're gonna get turned off. And then, you know, you, you really have a, a big job to do to get them back into reading. Um, so I would continue reading to the child to develop those, those uh, um, foundational skills and then talk to the teacher and see if a speech and language pathologist um, and or a psychologist can be involved um, and, and your child can be referred to them through the school and see what they are doing with those under the roof skills and um, how uh, they can be helped for those skills. Um, another uh, way of helping them uh, with regards to, sorry, I'm gonna go forward again, uh, with regards to phonological awareness is start um, a playing with words. Can they listen to a word and know how many syllables it is? Can they delete a syllable? Can they um, recognize rhyming words? Maybe when uh, you're reading to them now, grade one or grade two, you might not be able to find too many, um, you know, books that aren't aren't babyish that have rhyming couplets. But if you leave off the second word of a rhyming, the second rhyming word of a rhyming couplet, can they fill it in? Um, and so all of those uh, types of games and activities, those would be great things to start with uh, while you're possibly waiting for speech and language or psychology services to, um, to help with a child at school, but definitely talk to the teacher as well. And you know, you can always call the speech and language pathologist at, uh, that's involved with your child's school. You can find out their name, call them and say, can you get, just give me some activities that I can do at home um, with my child, uh, even though you know you haven't seen them. We have tons of resources and we like to share them. Or we could share that with the teacher and the teacher can share them with the parent. Great, thank you. Um, another one, uh, would the tier two students fall in the severe range on standardized language tests? No, uh, probably, SLPs would administer. Yeah. Probably more in the moderate range. Um, and, and some of those tier two kids might just be struggling with the, with the under the roof skills, the phonological awareness, phonics and orthographic rules, and may not even show any uh, weaknesses or areas of challenge in the oral language um, foundations at all. Uh, so that I would consider uh, both of those a sort of moderate, mild to moderate oral language difficulties and or the, just the, the phonological awareness, phonics and orthographic rule difficulties. Um, they could have uh, both or just one of those and still be considered um, struggling to learn how to read. Great. Karina, it's a quarter to nine, but we still have 117 people watching. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Do you want to continue answering questions or would you rather people email you? I am very happy to answer questions until whatever time. I'm happy for people to email me as well. I'm sorry, I don't think I um I gave my email out here, but I can I can certainly I'm happy to share it. Joanne, I know you you yep. have it. Maybe you can share it through uh through a communication with uh with the participants. Okay, I can do that in the chat right now. Excellent. But in the meantime, um, Aza and Veronica, if you're able to continue, we'll continue with questions. Is that okay? Of course. Okay. I'm happy to stay. Yeah. So I don't know if my connection is still bad or not, but uh, let me try one question. It sounds better so, now, Aza. Thank you. Just let me know if it breaks up again. Uh, so is there an age or grade when you would stop teaching phonological awareness and instead focus on spelling? No, because phonological awareness is a part 
of decoding and encoding. And I have seen, um, I've seen teenagers. I saw a 15 year old who, uh, and I assessed her and she, uh, I don't know how she was, she was actually reading, um, but I think she was using mainly her visual memory to read, but that meant she had to skip over a lot of words that she really didn't know how to decode. Um, and she really had very poor um, phonological awareness skills. And I suggested phonological awareness skills to her. Now, at that time, I wasn't aware of Language Live, which is that computer web-based program um, that's really targeted for children who are older and who may have higher level vocabulary, but really don't have those decoding skills or those phonological awareness, phonics and orthographic rule skills. Um, and that's what I would have recommended if I had known about it at that time. I don't even think it was uh, available at that time, uh, but I did recommend phonological awareness skills for her because you cannot decode a new word without having phonological awareness skills. It's part of how English works. Yeah, so um, even though, exactly, even though it's an early skill, you, you're saying that sometimes we need to go back and take um, children back to that. Well, it's not even taking them back. Yes. It's giving them it's giving them the tools that they need in order to decode a new word. If you don't, if you're not able to hear a word and segment its sounds, which is not, it seems like it's such an easy thing to do to us because we're readers, right? And we've done this for many, many, many years. But um, uh, I mean, if I said a, a, a sentence in another language, it would be very, it would be much harder for you to know how many syllables, what are the sounds, how do we separate, how do we segment those sounds? And um, if you think about children, that's, that's the same, issue they're having, the children who have these um, difficulties with phonological awareness. So it's not even going back, it's just a basic skill that you need in order to, um, in order to decode and encode. Uh, there is another question here about if you have any thoughts about uh, auditory processing assessments versus speech assessments. Right. So a uh, central auditory processing disorder, it's been a little controversial, um, both for speech language pathologists and audiologists. And um, I think a lot of audiologists and speech language pathologists kind of feel that central auditory processing disorder and some of these things that we've been talking about today, difficulties with uh, oral language comprehension and phonological awareness, um, those are actually um, almost the same thing with two different labels. Um, and so uh, I, I'm not saying that that's the case, but that's sort of what the, the controversy has been about. Um, so it would be interesting to see, I mean, uh, if, if your child has been diagnosed with CAPD and um, is benefiting perhaps from a sound field system in their classroom, that is wonderful. But I would always want to know what are their phonological awareness skills like? Do they have issues with phonological awareness? Um, and I don't even know if it's as well as the CAPD or as part of the CAPD. It's, uh, it seems like um, those two things are maybe um, synchronous in some ways. Okay, one last question. Sure. Okay. So um, are screeners for articulation or language or both? Um, screening tools, we, we have screening tools for, for everything. So we could have it for articulation, we could have it for language, we can have it for phonological awareness. So uh, we have screeners, for instance, um, the one I use for, um, it, it's called the preschool language scales and it's like, Two it's a two page screener. It's actually comes in, in um, on a, a pad of paper. You can just rip it off and you can do that screener very quickly and easily. And that is for oral language skills. Um, but we have screeners for phonological awareness and we have screeners for speech, but often um, for speech, especially for articulation, we would just listen to a child speaking and try and, um, you know, determine, okay, what, what are their errors? Um, and, you know, once you've been doing this for a while, you can hear them pretty clearly. 
Um, so, mm. so often we don't even do a screening. We just take a speech sample. And, and similarly, we often take a language sample to see if children have those skills of oral language expression. Do they have the grammatical components? Are they using a lot of empty words? And is that because they have a word retrieval difficulty? So we're, we're sort of looking at um, sort of big picture things like a language sample or speech sample. And then if we suspect that, oh, there's more going on here, that's when we might start doing some standardized testing. Thank you so much, Karina. You're and so thank welcome. you, Aza. Thank you, Veronica. We really appreciated your input and your help. So Karina, what a wealth of information you 